Today, I wanna to show you four techniques that hackers use to extract data from your SQL Server via SQL injection. But let's be clear before we even begin that you should not be doing this on a server that you don't own and you have permission to do this on. It's definitely some serious consequences like jail time if uh, you do this unauthorized and get caught. So just, just don't do it. Do it on your home machine. Do it on your practice VM. Learn how this is done so that you can better protect your code and your queries against hackers who try to use these techniques. So the first example is a union-based attack. This basically allows us to just concatenate whatever other data we want to the output of the original query and have that returned to us in either a SQL query or as part of our app or you know however this data is getting returned from the server. So let's start off by looking at our get user full name stored procedure here. We're passing in a username parameter, and then the query is just selecting the first and last name of that user from the users table. But instead of using a parameterized query, we're just concatenating the username value directly into our query string, making it injectable. And so just to kind of prove that real quick, if we pass in a valid username here, bdubs, into the stored procedure, we get one row of data to return exactly like we would expect. If we go back and then try to pass in some additional code, inject our own code into this stored procedure. So we're just adding this or one equals one, which should always evaluate as true. You'll see we'll get all of the rows in the table returning. Um, in this case, there's only two rows in this table, but we get all of the user's uh, information returning from our injected query. So now for our union based attack, it works very similar, but instead of concatenating some like or one equals one, we're actually just going to union all an additional query. So here I am selecting all the login names from the sys logins uh, table or DMV. I don't even know what this is, but uh, you could see here we have an SA login. We have some other internal SQL logins. This query is returning all of our servers logins. And so what we do is if we just prefix that with a union all and pass in a valid value there. We'll run this whole stored procedure. And this is our union based SQL injection attack because not only are we getting our original row of data that we wanted, but we're unioning all, all this other data. We're getting that back uh, as a bonus. And so that's a union based SQL injection attack. The next kind of attack I want to talk about is error based SQL injection. What error based injection attacks do is reveal information about the server by displaying that information as part of an error message. So if we take a look at this example now, we have our same stored procedure, but in our injected parameter, we're just passing in this query select cast system user as int. So if we were to run that query on its own, you'll see we get an error message saying that we can't convert the nvarcar SA value to data type int. And so if we include that as part of our injected parameter, you'll see we still get the same error message. So this is one way that a malicious user can trigger an error message. And if the application is returning it directly to them, they can gain some insight about your SQL server. So this type of error based attack is why it's very important not to reveal server error messages out just open in the public, right? You always want to handle those errors appropriately. If you need to display a user, uh, an error to the user, do so in a controlled fashion and not in a way that they can dictate what comes back in that error message. The first two types of SQL injection we looked at are known as in band SQL injection attacks. What that means is that the data that we're trying to extract with injection is returned directly to us. We add a union query, we get back results. We type in some invalid code, the error message directly gives us back some information. There's another type of injection attack, which is known as an out of band injection attack. And what that does is it indirectly gets us the data we're looking for. Now, one of the easiest ways to demonstrate how this works is by using XP command shell. If you're unfamiliar, XP command shell gives you command line access directly in your T-SQL queries, which is a great place for hackers to just take over your whole system and not just the SQL server itself. So uh, let's see how that works. So this attack is very straightforward. All we're going to do is inject a command. Here it is execute XP command shell, and then we're just going to use BCP to dump some data from the syslogins table out to a text file. And I uh, 
you know, with some additional options for that BCP command. So if I ran that, and I already did, we'll see that it outputs that file with all our data on it. The hacker can then do whatever they need to to extract that data from the machine, maybe email it to themselves, upload it to some website, you know, something like that. So even though in this example, we use XP command shell to save data off to a disk, and then figure out how to get it off through some other means, you can very easily use XP command shell or any of the other stored procedures that are built into SQL Server to do something like send an email message, for example, to get the data out of there. That's our out of band delivery attack. And so the final type of SQL injection attack I want to show you today is what is known as blind SQL injection. Blind SQL injection gets its name from the fact that when you use a blind attack, you're not directly getting information back from the server, either through an in-band or an out-of-band delivery method. What you do instead is rely on some other mechanism to tell you about the data on that server. So let's say your queries are well-tuned and perform very, very fast. Uh, in this case of our user stored procedure, it returns in a matter of milliseconds. So how can a hacker abuse that to gain information? Well, there are commands in SQL Server like wait for delay that'll make our statements run longer. We can tack on a wait for delay to a SQL query that we have and instantly know by the response of the web page or our application whether our condition that we wrote along with that wait for delay is triggering or not. So for example, if I want to test whether the current login is SA, um, we can write that as part of an if statement where if we guess the correct login name, our query is gonna be delayed for five seconds. Now, if our login name guess is incorrect, the query is still gonna return very quickly. If, however, there, the current login is SA, then we can expect our query to run longer and we have gained information about our SQL Server without directly actually getting any data back. This is a very tedious way, as you can imagine, of obtaining information about a SQL Server, but, when all other things don't work, this is a very reliable way of getting data from SQL Server. So before we do the blind injection example, let's just look at once again how quickly our stored procedure runs uh, with a normal expected parameter passed into it. You can see it's pretty much instant, right? Um, it shows zero, zero seconds. I'm sure it just took a few milliseconds. But now if what we do is add addition, an additional statement to our query, right? We can write an if statement here saying select the system user and check to see if it's equal to SA. And if it is, let's wait for five seconds before returning the query. And so what that'll do is our normal, very quickly executing query now takes much longer to execute, right? In this case, five seconds. And so even though the final result of this query, right, only returns the same, you know, username, first name, last name that it did previously, uh, because it took so long to execute, we're able to kind of test for different conditions by those means. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very tedious way of getting data out of a SQL Server, but it still works and it's important to protect against. So speaking of protection, what can you do to prevent an injection attack from happening to you? So the easiest way is to just not use dynamic SQL. If you don't use dynamic SQL, you're not gonna have an injection attack possible. What that means is if you have a parameter, like in our example, get user stored procedure, then just use it as a parameter in your query and don't concatenate it into a query string and then execute it later. If that's not an option, because sometimes you do have to use dynamic SQL in certain scenarios, then the best thing to do is to use SP execute SQL. SP execute SQL will safely parameterize whatever values you pass into as parameters to your dynamically built SQL string. And finally, the last thing you want to do is really restrict what access your logins and users have. If your app should only be allowed to execute stored procedures, make sure your user only has access to execute stored procedures. A lot of the injection attacks we looked at today happened because the account running these stored procedures had too much access available to it. And so those three pieces of advice, don't use dynamic SQL, Use SP execute SQL if you do have to execute a dynamically built string and really secure down your permissions should protect you in the vast majority of scenarios. 
I've linked to a longer session that I've given on SQL injection in the description below uh, for those 1% of scenarios that you might need to do something a little different to protect yourself. Um, but it's too much to cover in this short video. So go check that out at the Group by Conference, link to it below. And that concludes this week's episode. If you're not already subscribed, please press that subscribe button to be notified of future videos. And be sure to come back next Tuesday, if, especially if you like today's episode, because I'm planning on doing another episode on SQL injection where we brute force some usernames and passwords. It should be pretty fun. Um, anyway, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you then.